from the files of accurately nicknamed weapons. This is the so-called giant pain ray. It's technically called the active denial system, but really the nickname pain ray is so much more descriptive. This giant satellite looking thing, it, it shoots electromagnetic radiation at a target, also known as a human, uh, and it is intended to cause a lot of pain. The top layer of skin is supposed to absorb the radioactive rays and get very hot. In tests, people could endure the pain ray for about three seconds. Nobody lasted more than five seconds. So it hurts a whole heck of a lot, but in theory at least it does not kill you. Uh, this is the Taser X-Rep, the extended range electronic projectile. It's like the tasers you have seen cable news hosts volunteer to be shocked by, uh, only a lot more powerful and more terrifying. It is a little wireless taser that you shoot out of a gun. When the taser bullet hits a target, again, as in a human, it emits an electrical charge for almost half a minute. And this is something that is still in development, the pulsed elect energy projectile, excuse me, pulsed energy projectile. It's supposed to fire off a plasma beam that heats the air around it so quickly that, for lack of a better phrase, it makes the air explode. These are all supposed to be non-lethal weapons. When used on humans, they're supposed to hurt badly, knock you down, send you fleeing, but they are not supposed to kill you, even if the pain is so bad you wish they did. The argument for non-lethal weapons development is that in the military field, in the criminal justice field, there may be times when you need to or want to use force, but you don't want to kill people. Therefore, in an instance where you might otherwise use live ammunition to shoot and kill, you instead use the pain ray or the uh, souped up taser or maybe the explode the air pr pulsed energy projectile thing someday. You switch from a gun to a non-lethal means of getting what you want without using deadly force. That is the idea behind non-lethal weaponry. But it turns out that's not really the way that non-lethal weaponry gets used. Often, instead of just substituting for lethal force, non-lethal weapons just increase the number of occasions, the types of occasions on which force is used at all. Seattle police, for example, probably would have never used guns and live ammunition to shoot this 84-year-old woman who was the defining image of Occupy protests last week. But when Dorley Rainey was at an Occupy Seattle protest Tuesday night and police decided to use force on those protesters, they did pepper spray her right in the face. She was eventually escorted out of the crowd and to safety by an Iraq war veteran who she met that night. Before Dorley Rainey, there was an Iraq war veteran named Scott Olson. Last month, Mr. Olson was hit in the head with a blunt object at an Occupy Oakland protest. Organizers tell the media he was hit with a tear gas canister fired by police. It cracked his skull. His skull was fractured. He was in the hospital for about three weeks and faces a long recovery. Would police have used live ammunition to shoot at those Oakland protesters if they had not had non-lethal projectiles? In Denver last month, police in riot gear dispersed protesters with pepper spray and with rubber bullets. A 90s photojournalist was in Civic Center Park on another story when he found himself in the middle of a face-off between police and protesters. An officer shot a steady stream of pepper spray there into the crowd, then come rubber bullets. This man got some of the spray in his face, people near him trying to help, calling for more water to help flush out his eyes. Let's get the latest now from 9 News reporter Nelson Garcia. Things are still pretty tense right now, but as you can see right behind me, the crowd is still there. Things have calmed down quite a bit. Officers fired rubber bullets into the crowd as well as pepper spray and mace. Rubber bullets, pepper spray, mace. These things are not used as alternatives to live ammunition, necessarily, to actual guns with actual bullets in these protest situations, not unless you can imagine police in a live fire, live ammo situation if they weren't using those tools. These tools have essentially been used to give police officers more ways to use force against more people. By now you have probably seen this video shot Friday at the University of California at Davis. Nonviolent protesters sitting on the ground, their arms linked in a show of unity, and campus police officers spraying pepper spray essentially point blank directly into their faces. The protesters do not fight back. 11 protesters were treated for their injuries. Two had to be hospitalized. An investigation into that incident is now underway, and the school's chancellor is facing intense pressure over her supervision of the school's police department. In New York, where the Occupy Wall Street protests began two months ago, pepper spray has been one of the non-lethal weapons of choice for police. But recently, we've been hearing unconfirmed reports of something else, too. We've heard about it in Oakland as well. Uh, it's something called an LRAD, short for a long-range acoustic device. A protester at Occupy Wall Street tweeted a picture of this handheld one he claims was used by police on protesters. Another protester tweeted about it as well. The LRAD is basically a sound cannon, 
as designed, it's supposed to make a sound so loud and painful that humans can't stay nearby it. They're forced to run away from the weapon, hopefully before it causes hearing damage. One reporter for The New Yorker says that he saw the LRADs being used last week in New York. Quote, the NYPD descended on the park with deafening military-grade LRAD noise cannons and several stadiums worth of blinding Klieg lights. However, the New York Police Department denies using the LRAD, saying it only used it as a megaphone to broadcast instructions to the protesters. They are saying they did not use it as a weapon. We asked the NYPD for comment on that late this afternoon. They've not yet replied to our request, but we'll let you know when they do. In criminal justice, when you, you introduce new weapons that can do things that previous ones couldn't, you don't always just end up using, you, you don't just end up using force as often as you did before, only now you kill less people with that force. New weapons with new uses mean that you have the opportunity you, to use force a lot more than you did before. Without having pepper spray as an option, I cannot believe that Seattle police would have shot 84-year-old Dorley Rainey. Without tear gas, Oakland police would not have shot Iraq War veteran Scott Olson. Without pepper spray, UC Davis campus police, I do not think would have shot those 11 protesters with live ammunition. But because police had these non-lethal ways to use force, they used it. And this is the day-to-day -day reality of the protesters in the Occupy Wall Street movement across the country right now. Joining us now is Ray Lewis. He is a retired police captain from Philadelphia. He and 300 protesters were arrested last week at the Occupy Wall Street protest here in New York. Uh, captain Lewis, thank you for being here. Thank you. As a um, retired police captain um, and as somebody who has taken a stand for this movement and in fact been arrested there, how do you feel about the use of force um, at these protests? Well, use of force is absolutely necessary if they are met with force. And oftentimes at these protests, they are met with force. But the amount of force can only rise to the level where you overcome the minimum level necessary to overcome the force that you're receiving. And oftentimes that goes way above that. And that's also due to a lack of proper supervision at the scene. We're seeing um we're seeing things like pepper spray being used essentially as what they describe as a compliance tool, not to stop violence being directed from protesters toward police, but essentially to get protesters to do something that police want them to do. In the case of UC Davis, what they wanted those protesters to do was move, and they weren't moving. Um, I have a lot of uh, sympathy for uh, police in dangerous situations. I'm just inclined that way as a person. And yet I feel like when the average American looks at those pictures of what happens in UC Davis. There is almost nothing that could be done to make that protest stronger because of the sympathy that you have for those kids in that situation. Not only the average American, every American found that repulsive, yeah. including myself. I was, it was, I was profoundly shocked at that. And it is what they, they did is they gave the movement a, a tremendous weapon. And those people that endured that are going to look back at that and realize how important it was. Uh, the, what they happened to them was a tremendous movement because now you're including mainstream America looking at that and saying this is not right. Yeah. Can you tell me about the circumstances of, of your arrest last week and did you expect to be arrested and what happened around that? That's interesting. Uh, I went to that demonstration just with my sign. I was just going to hold it up and I had no intention of being arrested at all. In fact, it didn't even come into my mind. When I saw these individuals being led over, being arrested, the, their conviction inspired me because here they are, they're giving up their freedom for justice for other people, for everybody. And that conviction inspired me that, hey, I got to do it. And so I realized then, right there at the moment, that I'm, I'm going to be arrested. And I sat down. It was a totally legal arrest. I broke the law. I refused to move when ordered. And I was handled, uh, the, the arrest was handled in an exemplary fashion. Also for the, all, the, all the other protesters I saw, they all received professional treatment. We, there's been a sort of a, a tension, um, or maybe we've just seen two different things, two, di two contradictory things happening at the same time, which is that uh, we've seen protesters essentially try to reach out to police and say, you are the 99%. I've heard people chanting, uh, raises for the police, raises for the police. And we've seen people sort of trying to make common cause, but we have also seen these uh, sharp and in some cases very disturbing confrontations between police and protesters. You were there in uniform. What was your what were your, and holding a protest sign, what were your protest, what were your interactions like with the other police who were there on scene covering that as part of their job? Zero. Really? really. No, no reaction, 
nobody talking to you about the fact that you're in uniform? No, I have no, I have, well, the only I have had a little interaction, but it's very secretive, mm. and passing comments. But nobody, nobody talks to me like a regular conversation. Yeah. And your reaction from the protesters in terms of them seeing you there in uniform, but clearly on their side? Oh, uh, extremely thankful. And um, they said it gave them just tremendous motivation to continue this fight. In terms of your, now that you, you didn't mean to get arrested, but you did, what do you see as your continued involvement, if all, in supporting this movement going forward? Oh, absolutely. Uh, one of my goals is to try to increase a better understanding between the protesters and the police mm -hmm. and how to get their, the cause going forward in a better fashion than confronting the police. You're not going to win in any confrontation with the police. You are guaranteed you will lose. And so I'm trying to get them to understand even the vocal shouting is detrimental. You know, you, the, the, it causes no, uh, it doesn't help the situation at all when you're shouting about their mothers and everything else. And I'm looking to get people to talk to the police along the barricades. Uh, the police won't look at you when you're talking to them because they're trained not to. They don't, they don't want to be distracted. So they're not being ignorant. They're just doing what they're trained to do. But even though they're not looking at you, they are hearing you. And I'm telling protesters to just give their heartfelt feelings about why they're there and what's going on in their lives and their families' lives. That could be a very powerful de-escalating tool, I think. Um, retired police captain um, Ray Lewis, it's, uh, it was striking to see those photos of you being arrested, and um, it's a real honor to have you here. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me about this. Thank you very much. Sir, nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. We will be right back.